page 527, 527. Glory to his name. your name? <laughs> Brother Scotty, we appreciate you for sure. I would invite you to turn in your Bibles tonight to Genesis, Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, actually, actually a little bit further than that, Genesis 45. I was thinking of, of uh, what I was doing last week, as a matter of fact. Genesis 45, Genesis 45. As a matter of fact, you know what? I, you know what? Here's, what? here's what happens on Wednesday night. Are you ready? I grab my old notes. So now let's, now that you're in Genesis 45, you're pretty close to where we need to be. It is chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. <laughs> Genesis chapter 6, uh, beginning with verse 5. The only thing better than having too many notes is when I walk up here and I don't have any notes. Actually, some people say those are the best messages you ever preach, preacher. So, yeah, hey, look, as long as the, we let the Holy Spirit do the leading, amen? Genesis chapter 6, that's really, 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 really where we're going to be at beginning with verse 5. Genesis chapter 6, beginning with verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And this has got to be one of the saddest verses in all the Bible. Notice, and it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing. 
and the fowls of the air, for it repented me that I have made him. And then here has got to be one of the sweetest verses in all the Bible, right? But Noah, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. How would you like for all eternity to be recorded in scripture, your name and that you walked with God, amen? And Noah had begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Jephthah. And the earth also was corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. And all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah... The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without the pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make of it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A window shalt thou make in the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou furnish it above. And the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof, with lower, second, and third story shalt thou make it. Don't you just love the detail that the Lord uh, exercises here? We're reminded that we have a great God who is a God of detail. He's, he's interested in every detail of your life and mine. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth. To destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven. And everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant. And thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. And of everything, and of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female, of the fowls after their kind, and of the cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, two of every sort shall come unto thee, to keep them alive. And take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food and for thee and for them. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Again, Father, we do thank you for tonight. Lord, while we look at, of course, very familiar scripture, at least a very familiar story to many of us, Lord, I pray that we would just allow the Holy Spirit of God to really speak to us specifically about what it is exactly he wants to show us individually. Because sometimes when we look at familiar scripture, we, we can kind of lose sight of how you work in the preaching of the gospel. And so, yes, Lord, we're familiar with much of the story, but sometimes we miss some of the detail that matters so much. Lord, have your way with us, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. Notice again, Genesis chapter 6, Genesis chapter 6, verse 8, Noah, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So, 
the focus tonight is on Noah. What can we learn from Noah? More than we even have time to cover tonight. Noah, the man who built the ark. Now, some of you know of a fellow named Ken Ham who has actually built an ark. And he sure had a lot easier time doing building his ark than Noah did because he has all the all of the advantages of technology and machinery and everything that, that goes into that. But he actually did meet up with a lot of resistance. How interesting is that? He really did. Uh, in state and local government, uh, there was a lot of pushback. You know, you can open up a nightclub, I guess, and that's okay, but when you're going to open up a so-called religious thing, you know, people are going to get a little bit bothered by that. But where did he find his, where, where, where did he find his blueprint? Where did he find his uh, plans? Right here in the scripture, amen? And so you can see how there are going to be a whole lot of uh, different movies made and other concerns about uh, the ark. And the real truth is you need to stick to the Bible, amen? As a matter of fact, there was a movie made not too long ago about Noah uh, and uh, it was so far from the scriptures that you couldn't even, I mean, you couldn't even in any possible way see how somebody could be that far away from what the Bible has to say. I, that's why when somebody even tells me about a Christian movie, I say, well, listen, um, the book is better than the movie, amen? The book is better than the movie. But here I want the focus to be on Noah. Let's learn a little bit from Noah. Many faithful followers of Christ long to see real spiritual awakening. Do you think that that's what the world needed then? No doubt. They feel the times are corrupt. I can tell you every generation has thought how much more wicked can this generation be. I mean, look at what's taking place during the days of Noah. I, I tell people this when they talk about how bad things are today. Well, look at the church in Corinth. Look at how bad things were there in the church. And then look back uh, through the pages of the Old Testament. Go back to Genesis and see how things were even in the sixth chapter of Genesis. And, you know, we, we pray and we wait for God to intervene. We ask for God to do something. We look at the world that we live in today. And we see now many things that were just a few short years ago considered wrong or considered right even among our government. And we feel more and more like a minority when it comes to standing up for the things of the Lord. But we're not... We're not uh, the first ones on the block to have to live in times like these. Lessons can be learned from Noah that will, that will inspire born-again Christians in times that we do live in. And I got to tell you, with a little bit of rain, every, the, 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 the feeling and the nuance of Noah is ready to be preached tonight. Amen? So number one, quickly, let's notice together... Consider Noah and his times. First of all, consider the man. There are two sources from which information can be gained. He finds himself in the great uh, faith chapter. What would that be? Hebrews chapter 11, right? And uh, also, our Old Testament account uh, helps us to know a lot about Noah. Hebrews says that Noah was warned by God in Hebrews 11, verse 7. Uh, that is, God revealed his purpose to Noah. Does God speak to us today? He sure does, doesn't he? No doubt. As a matter of fact, that book that you hold in your hand, you can have complete confidence in it because it's the word of God. Amen? Amen. Noah was moved with godly fear as he talked with him. You know, that's something that we need to remember whenever we open up the scripture, whenever we spend time in prayer, that uh, we ought to recognize that we 
have stepped into the presence of the Lord. We need to be careful about that casual, uh, this is no big deal kind of attitude. He prepared an ark, and by doing so, uh, he, he, he was being responsible to do what God had asked him to do. Uh, this would be considered radical obedience, no doubt, because it was only a small minority that even at that time acknowledged the Lord. Have you ever thought about what it would be like if just you and your family were the only ones that had any interest in the things of God? That everyone else, and sometimes it kind of even feels that way, that everyone else uh, has gone the other way. And they mock and they insult and they, and, they, and they laugh and they joke about your faithfulness. You know, it's one thing when we come to church on Sunday morning, we see a crowd of folks and we're thankful that, you know, uh, we're able to fellowship with one another. They didn't have a local church to go to and a, and a fellowship of many more believers. It was Noah, yeah, and his family. You see, in this world in which we live in today, we find ourselves more and more able to relate to being in more of a minority than, than maybe for many of us ever before. Peter says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. You know, we're to be witnesses. We're to be, we're, we're, we're to hold to and preach and demonstrate the love of God, but also that God is, because he is a loving God, is a God who is a God uh, who has made a way for us. But he also is a God of judgment. We have to be Christians who preach the whole counsel of God. And did you know that, that it's the preaching and the teaching and the witnessing that matters? God is the one who gives the increase. Sometimes we we make the mistake of placing too much focus on, on, careful about this, our results. We need to make sure that, that we're trusting the Lord. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do the very, very best that we can, no doubt about it. You know, if somebody is never sharing the gospel with anybody and then they say, well, it must not be God's will that my neighbor gets saved, I'm here to say there might be a little bit of a problem there, amen? The Old Testament gives three characteristics of Noah. Uh, he was a just or righteous man. We read this in Ezekiel 14, 14. He was perfect in his generation. This means that he was mature and sound in judgment. It doesn't mean that he was without sin because we know that that in fact is not the case. He also walked with God as Enoch did. And that in and of itself was absolutely amazing considering the times. And that's what we need to do next, consider the times. It was a wicked time, no doubt about it. Genesis 6, 5 says, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Does that sound a whole lot like the world today? Oh my, it sure does. And sadly, that sounds a whole lot like cardinal Christians. People who have trusted Christ, but they're walking so far off that they look like, walk like, and talk like the world. Wickedness was so bad that God regretted even making man. I mean, think about that. Have you ever been in a situation where someone regrets the, the sin of a, a child or, or something that someone else has done that, that, uh, that it grieves them so? I mean, God regretted make, having made man. Now, may I just say 
my brain isn't big enough to fully comprehend and appreciate this. God is sovereign. He's on the throne. He's in control. But this demonstrates, and the focus needs to be on my sin, the sin of man. And, and recognize that, that, yes, well, God is sovereign on the throne and in control, and, and God's plan ultimately is, is what is playing out here. It's for me to recognize and consider in my own heart where I'm at and, 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 what, and what I need to do. And that's why we consider some of the lessons to be learned. And this is just a short list compared to all that can be found here. But first of all, please notice with me, people are to take God at his word. Amen? People are to take God at his word. At times, humanly speaking, doing what God says to do may appear foolish even. You know, one of the mistakes that we make too often, especially it seems like, most recently is that we almost sometimes kind of give children the idea that, well, you don't need to do what mom and dad say unless you agree with it or you completely understand it. I can tell you, when I was a kid, <laughs> I didn't agree much with what they wanted me to do, but I still had to do it, amen? And, you know, that's the way we are with the Lord. You know, we... Uh, we try to philosophy and justify uh, his precepts and his standards. And, and my Bible says that if you love me, keep my commandments. That's real simple. And the real truth is we need to do what the Lord wants us to do even when we don't even know for sure or completely understand why the Lord would have us to do that. You say, does that mean that... You know, if I have a dream and I'm supposed to go and, you know, um, you know, divorce my wife, that that's because God told me, no, 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 it's none of this kind of nonsense. You have in your hand the complete word of God, amen? You have confidence today that from Genesis to Revelation, this is God's uh, absolute instruction book and and. And, 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 and book of, of counsel to you. There's, no, there, there's nothing that you have to say that has anything to do with having some kind of a new revelation. But there are times when, when we're reading the Bible and we're praying and we're seeking a, a godly counsel that, that some of the things that we're asked to do don't always make a whole lot of sense or complete sense to us. And we need to listen to the Lord. We need to obey the word of God. And uh, we need to be careful not to disregard it. And I'll tell you what else we need to be careful about. And that is thinking that because we're not responding to God's word, not doing what we're supposed to do, and it seems like nothing has happened, that that is just okay and that it will continue to be that way. Uh, God is the one who is who is on the throne in control. And we need to be careful about this idea that, you know what, it's just not that important. Usually when somebody comes to me and they want to talk about uh, a concern or an issue, and I'm talking about a counseling type of a setting, I will always ask them this question. How, how important is the word of God to you in your decision making in your life? And you might think, well, every Christian's going to say, oh, yeah, they're 100%. That's what I'm all about is whatever the Bible says. But you'd be surprised at how many people actually don't say that. And until you get to a place where you just believe that that, that has to be your highest priority, uh, you're going to treat God's precepts and you're going to treat God's teaching as maybe helpful and sometimes significant, or at least slightly, but not always, you know, 100% a high priority. And you can just see that in many cases today. Uh, over and over again, I see situations where uh, people are, I mean, even on social media, you see people posting, I love the Lord, da 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 and then the next thing they post is completely contrary to the things of God. 
And I got to tell you something. Uh, it is important that we believe the word of God, that we trust the word of God, and that we respond to the word of God. We're to take God at his word. Notice God's people are not to make decisions based on the mockery of others. You know, when we talk about peer pressure, it seems like we're usually hearing that phrase used when there's a message being preached to the youth group, amen? Can adults be struggling with peer pressure? Oh, you know it. Can you ever outgrow peer pressure? Well, the pressure is always going to be there. Your response to it, hopefully we mature and understand uh, we're able to resist more. But I know people who, who, who really have a tough time. Maybe they're okay on Wednesday night or Sunday morning or Sunday night. Maybe they're great when they're around other Christians, when everybody's saying, hey, brother, hey, sister, sure good to see you. Praise the Lord. Hope you're having a blessed time. But then when they walk back out into the world and they again realize, hey, you know what? I'm in the minority again. <laughs> I'm one of the ones who everybody looks at and thinks is a little bit odd. We need to be careful. I mean, this is probably the hardest thing Noah had to accept. No doubt. He was mocked and ridiculed by the masses who thought that building an ark was, I'm just going to use this word, stupid. What are you doing? Are you crazy? Some would even say that at this time, People didn't even have a real appreciation for what real rain was about. I mean, so can you imagine this large ship being built on land? Radical Christianity today means you're trusting the Lord, that you're actually believing God, and you're doing what you believe the, what, what, uh, what the Lord wants you to do. And I can tell you, we, we will often even come up against others who, who say that they're Christians, who say that, you know, that, that they love the Lord. And they'll, they'll even say things like, well, you know, you really don't need to come to church, do you? I mean, maybe once in a while. You know, like the ones that we call creasters, remember that? Those are the ones that come on Christmas and Easter, Right? But the real truth is, we, we are going to always, as long as we're breathing air on this side of eternity, we're going to have, yes, even, I would say, struggling Christians and the unsaved, which, by the way, as far as I'm concerned, is the majority of the world, um, looking at everything we do the same way they looked at, at Noah. I can't believe, you know, I, I, I have family. I've been, I've, been a, I've been in ministry for 30 years, and I have family who, who think, boy, you sure, you know, you take this stuff so seriously, and you're, you know, you've been doing this for the longest time. Yet I look at, you know, what, what's happened with some of my family and their, and their children and others, and I'm thinking, I don't know, you just need to open your eyes a little bit. But the real truth is, we can appreciate how Noah felt. There are some dangers of being genuinely Christian. Well, what do I mean by that? First of all, Christian should describe the fact that you're a follower of Christ. Amen? They were called Christians first at Antioch. Amen? And that was because they demonstrated a, a, that they were following the Lord. Uh, y y when you're when you trust Christ as your Savior, you're saved. You're born again. It's going to be now you're walking with the Lord that's going to... It's not going to be a, a t-shirt that tells everybody that you're a Christian, that shows them that you're a Christian. It's going to be your walk in relationship with the Lord. And to be genuinely Christian means to be genuinely serving the Lord, genuinely loving the Lord. And the world just can't understand that. The world, they're willing to accept maybe somebody who calls themselves a Christian, maybe like some of the so-called Hollywood Christians and, or some of the other nominal Christians out there. 
but somebody who really takes a stand, who really uh, is, is willing to, you know, withstand the world, uh, the world has a tough time with. The people of the world will call you a fool. That's the truth. And the sad truth is, this may even come from family. I mean, sometimes I think we do new Christians a disservice, new believers a disservice when we don't prepare them for the fact that Jesus said, they hate me. They will, yes, they will hate you. I mean, that seems a little bit over the top, but it's the word of God. You will be mocked. Uh, you will face tough times for choosing Christ. There's no doubt about it. And then please notice, righteousness is by faith. Amen? Not by works. Paul says that we're saved by grace and not through faith and not of works. It is not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. You know, a person can even do a lot of good things and be a, uh, a, a, a do-gooder, a person who does good, but that doesn't, that, that, that doesn't mean that they're, of course, demonstrating what is the highest priority. The highest priority is having faith in the Lord, trusting the Lord, uh, getting saved, and then recognizing that your good works are just an outward manifestation of what has taken place in your heart. You see, what had to happen with Noah is what has to happen uh, for the one who wants to follow the Lord. You need to place your trust in the Lord and, and have confidence in the Lord. And it won't be your good works that get you to heaven, but it'll be obviously your faith in Jesus Christ. Can I tell you, interestingly enough, when people understand that it's your motivation for service is your love for the Lord, it makes all the difference in the world. When somebody is, is just going through the motion and, and, you know, trying to do the best that they can. When things get tough, I'm just going to say, they're going to be gone. They're going to be out the door. In our day, when there's so much we see going on, violence, corruption, ungodliness, uh, the Lord is, is looking for people who will do the right thing. Do right because they love the Lord. And you know what? This needs to be our desire. We have examples like Noah so that we might realize that no matter, I got to tell you, how bad things get, um, God is saying, take a stand, be, be a man of God, be a woman of God, and, and, leave, and leave the rest to me. You know what? I think of my grandchildren. I still think of my children a little bit every once in a while too, but I also think of my grandchildren. And I got to tell you something. Should the Lord tarry, I think about the world that they're growing up in. And I think about how the same direction that I gave my children growing up, I, I, hope, for, I hope for my grandchildren that no matter... That's right. No matter how wicked this world may get, no matter what may happen... Um, Keep your eyes on the Lord. Stay focused on the Lord. Stay focused on loving him and, and uh, serving him. Amen? Amen? Amen. And of course, on Wednesday night, we have an opportunity to break up and do a little bit of praying together. And I think this study tonight reminds us that that work that is going on right over there in Vacation Bible School, where we have... We have Folks stepping up and serving. We think of all the preparation that went into that. Think of how really a small group of people can make an impact on the lives of children. Amen? I mean, when I walked by, uh, Anel was talking to a little one. Uh, and I'm here to tell you, it matters. It matters. Now, it may, 
it may not even be that big of a deal to a lot of people. As a matter of fact, there are more and more churches that are not doing vacation Bible school anymore. Think about that. Because it doesn't, you know, that doesn't put any money in the offering plate, I guess. I don't know what their, their motivation is. That's sad, isn't it? But I'll tell you what. If one precious little one gets saved through this, I say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And yes, we recognize that that little one may even come from an unsaved family. May be going right back out into a world. But we want them to know Jesus for sure. Amen? Amen. Well, let's do some praying, guys, all right? How about it? Prayer requests? Praise reports? Anybody?